Thank you, choir, Jackie and Grace, and thank you, Anne, for, again, for sharing your story. Our sermon text, which I paraphrase in the time for the child, is Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 15. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you. And each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way I will test them, whether they follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against him, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the Israelites, Draw near to the Lord, for he has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. The Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard of the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine, flaky substance, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What's this? For they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, the Israelites have been wandering in the wilderness for about six weeks, and unbeknownst to them, they still have 39 years and 46 weeks left to go. (laughs) Our text says that the whole congregation complained against Moses and Aaron, but that's an understated translation. A better translation might be they were calling for insurrection against Moses and Aaron. And to be fair, the Israelites are not simply complaining because life in the wilderness wasn't quite what they saw in the travel brochure. They are generally concerned for their survival. Will they be able to have enough water and food for them to survive? And God hears these complaints, these threats of insurrection among the people, and provides quail at night as a source of protein and manna in the morning as a source of carbohydrates and sugar. Now the problem with the Israelites is not so much that they were whining or complaining. And I remember that Fred Craddock, a a wonderful storyteller and preacher, recalls the time when his father told him that it simply is not possible to modulate the human voice in such a way as to make whining sound pleasurable. (laughs) It cannot be done. But again, their sin is not so much the whining or even threatening insurrection. The biggest problem is that they were forgetting the God who had liberated them from bondage in Egypt. Later in the story, the Israelites will keep some of the manna in jars and carry it around in the Ark of the Covenant as a way of remembering God's provisions for them in the wilderness. And then many centuries later, Most scholars believe that that was when this story was finally written down. Long after Israel had reached the promised land and flourished, and after they fell into the hands of big scary Babylon, being carried off in captivity into exile, 
And once again, Israel found itself displaced. And what did they do? They told the story of their ancestors' displacement, to hold on to that identity, to remember who God is, who they are. They were calling on the wisdom and the narrative of those who came before and asking, how will God make a way now? Will God provide again? And this story seems important today, doesn't it? Will God provide again and keep providing? And perhaps this is why many of the rabbis and sages through the ages have often regarded the wandering around in the wilderness as the golden history of Israel. Not the so-called glory days of David and Solomon and the outreaches of empire, but this wilderness time. This wilderness time was the golden time because it was then that the people had no choice but to rely on God. And in our own community of faith, what would you consider to be the glory days? Perhaps 2008, before the financial crisis hit that fall, when KPC had 200 in worship and a bustling Sunday school, was it then? Or would it be this present time as we wheeled our way through a COVID and post-COVID wilderness? I remember a story that one of Rhoda's uncles told. He told it to the pastor who came before I came. And he said, now are the glory days that people will be talking about. And I wondered why Jeff Kellum was telling me the story that like one of the congregants said that during the time of his pastorate were the glory days, but good luck, kid. But then I realized that what Rhoda's uncle was actually saying was that now are the glory days that people will be talking about. Now are the glory days, any time when we learn to rely on God and seek out God's calling. That is the glory time. A Presbyterian pastor posted the following to a Facebook group that I'm a member of. And he writes that the staff at my church had a meeting and came to the realization that one of the reasons why we're not seeing as much engagement in church programs as we'd like is because people are exercising their Sabbath in ways that are more convenient for them. Church programs are seen as just one more thing on the schedule rather than an opportunity for community that they might otherwise get by attending a sports game or grabbing drinks with friends. Our congregation is 800 plus strong, but lately it feels like about 80. We've been back to in-person worship for months. In some ways that has helped, but there are many families that are too busy for church. We've done some out-of-the-box stuff like date nights for parents. We provide free childcare for a couple of hours, even an outdoor worship service with bouncy houses for kids, but these events were not entirely successful. And then this pastor asked, are you seeing the same things in your congregation? Is the post-COVID reality very different from the pre-COVID reality? And then this pastor goes on to muse that, that maybe part of the larger issue is that we're forgetting some of the lessons of the pandemic. We're forgetting the importance of, of rest or striving for a better family and work balance. We're forgetting those things that we identified as priorities during the height of the pandemic. And we're getting busy again, as busy as we can and we're filling ourselves with all kinds of things. And when we do that, we're no longer hungry for the manna. And I think a big question for us is, how can we rediscover the manna? And again, I ask your forgiveness if I ruined this Bible story for you by reminding you of that insect that excretes the extra sugar. 
And please feel free to disagree with me. I much prefer it to be angel food cake crumbs myself. But I shared that because I think that we have to look at this story in new ways. And we have to think about how it applies to us in new ways. We have to be resourceful and creative. We have to be on a manna alert. Now, I don't want to overstate the case. I don't want to make this super sharp distinction between Egypt and the promised land on the other side of this wilderness. I'm not trying to say that all of the beautiful programs and activities that Anne just shared about are things of the past and never to come again. Absolutely not. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not trying to overstate the case at all. But I don't want to understate the case either. We have to be forward-looking. We have to be looking for new sources of manna. And one of the things that I noticed is that Anne about a half a dozen times mentioned recent outreaches of the church, recent activities to get people together to serve together and reflect on the meaning of that service. And some of that creativity, some of that innovative thinking that we were just beginning or have been exploring before the pandemic is exactly what we need now after the pandemic. And part of being on a mana alert is looking for these new sources of spiritual vitality. Just for a moment, put aside all the things that you're regularly filling yourself with and ask yourself, what do I need to vitalize my own spiritual life? And as a church, we can also be on this manna alert. And if you think about it, every year the church does something that is kind of manna-esque. We make a budget for the year with the hopes that it, will be, that it will be met by the generosity of the congregation. And at first glance, the budget may look like your run-of-the-mill line-itemed piece of paper. We have to keep the lights on. We have to pay the, the staff. Uh, we pay off any debts, including lead abatement expenses. But budgets are also moral and theological documents. When we make a line item for expanding our outreach, perhaps even including the updating of our live streaming technology. We are putting our hope in spreading the good news of Jesus Christ and of this community that gathers here around Christ's table. When we ask the congregation to make a mission pledge in addition to the operations pledge, we commit to answering Christ's call to feed our neighbors, to offer them the very manna that we have found. And when we have a line item for building and electricity expenses, it's not only for our own benefit during the week or on Sunday alone, but it's also for when we welcome our emergency shelter partnership guest in the winter. And our commitment to give financially to the church is to invest in the faith community we are a part of, which one friend calls the, the pop-up of the kingdom of God in our community. And it's an act of faith putting our dollars toward the ever-expanding, inclusive, and vibrant welcome of God to those around us. And because God provides manna for us wherever we look, we can afford to be generous. Truly, these are the glory days. Any time that the church seeks to answer God's call in the here and now is a glory. What's this? It's God's provisions for everything that we need for a vibrant spiritual life. It's God's provisions for everything that we need to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with our God. All glory and praise be to our God. Amen.